All right, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming to the first uh, seminar of the semester. This is the NREM seminar. And um, our speaker today is Chris Janelle. Thanks. <laughs> who hails from the faraway land of Boone, Iowa. Chris is a natural resource biometrician with the Iowa DNR. He earned his bachelor's from Rutgers University, his master's from the University of Arkansas, and his PhD from Cornell University. He did some postdoctoral work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison during which he focused on cross-species chronic wasting disease surveillance, surveillance sampling design, and transmission modeling. Chris will be discussing some of this work with his talk titled, Modeling Transmission Dynamics of Chronic Wasting Disease in Wisconsin White-Tailed Deer. So please help me welcome Chris Janelle. Thank you everybody, I appreciate it. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you guys today. Can you guys hear me back there okay? Is that loud enough? Just let me know if it's not, okay? I'm not used to the acoustics in this room. <coughs> so uh, please pardon my talk. It was hastily put together and um, hopefully it might be a little bit less, uh, less, less time than you might usually spend at a seminar. So uh, at least you get to spend more time doing something fun Friday evening. Uh, in any case, I'll just give you a little background about myself. My background is in quantitative ecology and I focused uh, in, in wildlife disease, dynamic, d disease dynamics in particular. And I don't pretend to be an expert in CWD, but I've had the good fortune to be able to work with a lot of experts in this field and uh, experience a lot of collaborations with, with really bright people in the CWD world and disease uh, world in general. So um, anyway, the, the work I'm gonna present to you is based on some of my postdoctoral work that I was completing in uh, University of Wisconsin, Madison, from uh, 2007 to roughly 2012. Uh, this work is roughly based on a publication that colleagues and I uh, just got published this year in PLOS One. And um, I, will, I will note that I will pass over many of the esoteric mathematical details. And of course, if you're interested in those, I'm happy to oblige after the talk. Uh, but, but please, uh, feel free to ask any questions you have. And uh, I just wanted to get the big picture kind of things across to you guys. And uh, yeah, talk about CWD in Wisconsin. So, chronic waste and disease, which I'm sure most of you, if not all, have heard of, is a fatal neurodegenerative transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. Wow, that's really a long mouthful. Uh, it is a family, it's in a family of TSEs. Uh, some of these TSEs that are related include uh, BSE, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which uh, is commonly referred to as mad cow disease. Scrapie in sheep and goats, which we know has been around between 200 and 300 years. So this, this is, these kind of diseases, it's family of, of, of diseases has been around for a long time. And then CJD, which is creutzfeldt jakob disease, and the, the variant of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is actually what infects humans when they eat uh, BSE-infected meats. So uh, the causative agent or the suspected causative agent that we feel is, is, is responsible for this, this family of diseases is a prion. Uh, a prion is a protein. It's a naturally occurring protein that circulates through the systems of all mammals. And uh, all it is is simply a chain of amino acids. It doesn't have any RNA or DNA, no genome, and it has some funky little secondary and tertiary quaternary structures kind of fitting onto this amino acid chain. And it can take a number of different forms. And actually an interesting thing about it is it can adapt, <coughs> but not in sort of a traditional sense of adaptation. Um, uh, I, the best I've heard it said is, is, is sort of structural tweaks in the, for, the form and shape of the amino acids and their structure. And the strange adaptation works from there. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty strange. Uh, it's highly resistant to degradation. So it takes incineration with extreme amounts of heat for a long amount of time to actually degenerate the infectious prions uh, or using other very caustic substances. It can last in the environment for many, many years, which clearly poses a threat for future transmission to uh, critters. 
the transmission mechanisms that we think uh, are really driving this, this disease, they vary. The main mechanism, or at least the main supported mechanism so far, is horizontal transmission. So direct contact between animals, an infected and a susceptible animal. Indirect, there is evidence of indirect transmission as well. So if an animal, a susceptible animal, comes in contact uh, via a fomite with infectious material, whether it be on a, a salt lick or on a fence, that could result in transmission as well. And there is some evidence of vertical transmission, uh, and there, there's still a lot of work going on as far as, 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 as far as its contribution to sort of the disease dynamic and whether it has a huge impact at this point. So when, when I talk about transmission and the, the point of this work, there are many, many different transmi transmission modes that take these specific mathematical forms. The simplest, the simplest starting point for thinking about these transmission modes is considering two alternatives. Frequency dependence is, is one end of a spectrum of these transmission modes. And one easy way to conceptualize frequency dependence is thinking about how infectious contact rate scales with host density. So as we increased host density in a given area, in a frequency dependent transmission process, infectious, con uh, infectious contact rate remains constant. So what this means is that transmission of disease doesn't depend on the density of the underlying host. So this is a pretty tricky situation. What it depends on is the prevalence of the disease. So a lot of uh, sexually transmitted diseases actually operate under this form of, of transmission mode. So on the opposite end of the spectrum is density dependence, which I'm sure most of you, if not all, have heard. Very simply, as we increase host density, infectious contact rate increases in a linear fashion or approximately linear fashion. So as we increased, Host density, our transmission increases. Our transmission rate will increase. So these are two opposite ends of a spectrum, and they're very simple models. There's a number of sort of nonlinear forms that can that, that one can construct that uh, can be that can vary across this this this, this whole space here. Uh, I'm not going to worry about those, and there are many papers that explore different non nonlinear dynamic transmission forms. So I wanted to keep it simple and focus on these two sort of major forms. So the current CWD distribution, so at least 22 states, American states, and two Canadian provinces that we know of that have CWD either in captive facilities or in the wild uh, cervid uh, populations. And cervids include white-tailed deer, mule deer, moose, elk, so all of those, those kinds of critters can get CWD. So my work that focused in Wisconsin, it, it's been around since 2001. It was first identified from an animal that was harvested in the fall of 2001 in southwestern Wisconsin. And uh, in one sense, the rest is history, lots of it not too pleasant history. So just to give you an idea of the distribution of CWD in the major parts of the state. So right here is Wisconsin. And this is Illinois. This is the southwestern, this is the southwestern core, this, this red block right here. And this actually, this area represents what we think is the origin of CWD in Wisconsin. And this is sort of the focal area of my data, uh, data usage. This gray shaded area here is called the CWD management zone. Well, it used to be the CWD management zone. I don't think they, uh, they uh, adhere to that definition anymore. They've, they've changed a little bit. This area encompasses approximately 9,000 square miles and uh, basically constitutes the major areas where CWD has been found in Wisconsin. And as you can see, it overlaps with Illinois quite a bit. So, uh, so we're just considering Wisconsin for our data. I don't consider any of the Illinois data. Since 2012 or so, there have been uh, a couple hot spots that have been identified with CWD infected individuals in northern Wisconsin. But we're not going to worry about that. 
So, so far, approximately 185,000 animals have been sampled over, uh, over the past 10, 11 years. Yes? Really quick question. Mm -hmm. What are the sampling protocols that you use for this? The sampling protocols? Yes. So these, so these animals actually are hunter harvested animals. And we would actually, or the DNR, would go and, and sample these animals. So using IHC or ELISA to test for CWD, collecting lymph nodes or OBEX brain material. Answer your question? So yes, so this, this, is, this data is primarily composed of hunter harvest information, hunter harvest data that the DNR was able to collect samples, CWD samples for and test for. So just to give you sort of an idea, this is, uh, this is based on the, the Southwest Core area, that red block, my, my primary study area that I showed you before. And it's easy to see, obviously, CWD prevalence has been increasing quite drastically in both adult females and yearling females uh, over time, and with no indication of stopping. Uh, a number, well, in the early years, between 2002 and approximately 2007, Various harvest strategies were used in attempts to control and eradicate CWD. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of that. There's, there's a long history. Uh, but as you can see, it didn't, doesn't appear that it worked very well. Now, the same thing happens with males. A strongly increasing pattern in disease prevalence in adult males, and uh, not, as, not as steep, but an increasing pattern in yearling male prevalence as well. In general, though, males tend to have higher prevalence than females, and older animals tend to have higher prevalence than younger animals. It's very general. So the study questions, what, what did I address in this particular study? Well, one thing we wanted to nail down was, could we get an idea of the best supported transmission model for CWD in this particular system in Wisconsin? And there's, this, is, this is an open question for many wildlife disease systems. And a little bit of work has been done in the CWD, CWD system before. Several colleagues actually published a paper in 2009 using similar data and to try and nail down this difference between, OK, are we dealing with a frequency-dependent transmission process in southwestern Wisconsin or a density-dependent process? Unfortunately, they didn't have enough data at the time to really tease apart the differences. There wasn't enough signal in the data to tease apart if there was a difference if, if, trans, if transmission was FD or DD. So one of the things we were thinking is, that, OK, I come along as a postdoc. We've got more data. We'll try this little thing again, see if we, uh, we can, we can you know, catch a signal. Another question we wanted to ask was, can we actually account for sex-specific variation? in the transmission coefficients themselves. We know that there are differences in prevalence between the sexes. So can we capture that in the actual transmission coefficients themselves that, that sort of make up our transmission model? And we wanted to estimate the time since disease introduction. I'm not going to go into the details of how this is done. I'm happy to talk to you afterward. But it gives us a rough approximation, given the data. It gives us an estimate of when CWD possibly arrived in Wisconsin. So it gives us a, a very rough sort of feel under a set of limiting assumptions, but it's a good first, first place to start. So another thing we ask are the implications of different harvest strategies. Clearly, the Wisconsin DNR was very interested in controlling and eradicating CWD. We were interested in evaluating some alternative strategies that they might consider uh, that could or could not have an effect on CWD prevalence uh, in, in southern Wisconsin. So we considered several different types. We considered a no-harvest strategy. We considered a sustainable, what we call a sustainable strategy, which basically that's uh, it's a subjective term. It's, it's the average uh, harvest rate of males and females that was taken over the sampling data years. So it's just an average kind of observed rate of harvest for males and females. And then we focus on a male or a female-focused harvest strategy. So, and I'll go into more details with those. It, 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 it sounds exactly like what it is. A male-focused strategy is simply harvesting males a lot more than females. Female-focused harvesting females a lot more than males. I'll get into details a little bit more here. So with that question in particular, uh, in the no-harvest har no scenario situation, we assumed resource limitation. So in that scenario, you might en envision 
deer, a deer population in an unhunted area. Maybe a national park, maybe a suburban uh, quasi-city environment where no hunting is allowed. So we wanted to sort of simulate what this sort of situation, situation might look like uh, in particular, we, we set a, a carrying capacity in that context for, of 200 deer per square mile, which is approximately what we think the deer carrying capacity was in Wisconsin, southern Wisconsin at the time. So the sustainable harvest strategy, like I said before, in this case, it was just the average of, of male and female harvest over the period of, of observed years. So these numbers seem a little odd. The male focused and female focused are more interesting because that's obviously placing the burden of harvest on males and male harvest, male focused, and then females and female focused. Now these are arbitrary proportions. We, we want to just provide a range, basically, of different harvest types to see if we could actually find, you know, some uh, difference in the signal of prevalence that would occur over time. So, how do we do this? Well, we use a multi-state matrix model, and. Um, so there's a lot that goes into this sort of modeling approach. Uh, we, we, we compartmentalize things uh, a bit by sex, age, the seasonality, and we consider two broad seasons within a given year, just a summer and a winter. So each, each period was six months. And then infection stage, which I will go into a little bit more detail. So this is a, a, a general compartmental model that you find oftentimes in SIR, SR, uh, SIRS uh, type uh, disease systems. So, and very simply put, the first compartment that you find is susceptible compartment. So these are all the host animals that are susceptible to disease. And then you can have a transition to infected animals. This is the first stage of infection. And this first stage of infection, we believe, starts with a lymph node positive sort of state. So when you test lymph nodes, they're the first to become infected that we think. And then moving on from this, this infected stage, this initial infected stage of lymph node positive, we go to an obex positive. An obex is part of the brain. And that's when it starts to get really bad. Your brain starts to get infected. And then ultimately, you, you develop clinical signs of infection. And I'm sure you've heard of some of those clinical signs. They're really uh, nasty. Drooling, uh, disorientation. Uh, losing weight, all kinds of weirdness going on. So uh, at this stage of the game, you don't have much time to survive. The disease is uniformly fatal. There is no cure. And uh, so each of these different compartments can lead to death. There's a this compartment in particular is sort of a disease-induced mortality compartment. But of course, during these stages, animals can die for other reasons, namely being harvested or depredated upon and other things, hit by cars. <coughs> so uh, just to give you a little bit more detail in the progression of the timeline for this, this, sort, of, this sort of process, on here we have this, this time element. So at time zero, one can become infected. And what we assume in our modeling structure is that over the next six months, uh, there's a latency period during which individuals can become infected lymph node positive. Over the next six months again, so at time 12 months, one year past initial infection, we assume that OBEX, the OBEX itself becomes positive, so brain infection. Then there's a, uh, uh, another lag during which you can remain in the OBEX stage and then finally become clinical at 24 months. And then from the clinical stage, within another six months, you die. So there are parameters which, which define each of these transitions, and several of them are fixed. Like the, transi the transition between infected, lymph node positive, and OBEX positive, we set as gamma, we set it equal to unity. So we assume that when you're lymph node positive, you will become OBEX positive as well. So there, there is no stochasticity in that context. So when you go from O, the OBEX positive stage, to clinical, we assume that over each six-month period, there's a 50% chance that that can happen. So this is, just, this is just an average. When you go from clinical, once you actually reach the clinical phase, to death, we define that as alpha. And again, that's unity. So within six months after becoming clinical, we assume you die. 
in the model itself, since we already defined these, these compartment specific parameters, the one that we actually estimate, which is related to beta, which is the transmission coefficient, is this parameter pi, okay, which is the probability of becoming infected. So there's a, a nice little formula that relates how this, this parameter pi actually functions with beta and there's a simple sort of uh, translation between the, 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 um, the infection rate and the probability of becoming infected, which is what this pi is. So when I show you the results that outline our beta coefficients that we estimated, just keep in mind that those are dimensionless sort of, they're, they're dimensionless parameters and that they actually are a piece of a larger function that we use to estimate pi or the probability of infection. So the methodology, a little bit more specifically, we use a likelihood profile analysis. We use data from 2002 to 2013, and again, this is all hunter harvest data uh, in, in that, in that uh, CWD management zone. There were approximately 16, 17,000 records that we used. Of those, 958 of those individuals were actually found to be positively infected. We used a binomial likelihood function uh, within sort of a, a likelihood profile analysis to actually produce our estimates of the beta coefficients and the TDI, time since disease introduction. So there are a number of assumptions in this modeling approach. It's, it's in the context of disease dynamics and disease studies, there, there is a very simplistic sort of model. We assume that there are deterministic transitions between states. So there's no stochasticity, which is, which is a pretty important thing to think about for kind of real life situations. So, but we wanted to keep it simple and, and sort of easy to deal with on a first pass approach. We assume that there was spatial homogeneity. So if, if you recall that, that the particular study area, this, this red box that was in that map, that was, um, that was approximately 210 square miles where that sort of presumed origin of CWD occurred. We assumed that dynamics within that 210 square miles was homogeneous, approximately homogeneous. So not, we didn't assume any spatial structure whatsoever within that block. We assumed that there was homogeneous transmission and mixing uh, within age and sex and infection classes. So we didn't think about variations between uh, males giving infection to females or females giving infection to males or any other kind of things like that. We just kept it nice and simple, homogeneous. And we assumed that there was no migration inside or out of the area. So sort of effectively a closed population with respect to movement. So we get to results. And this is, uh, this is just basically a, a simple table of the, uh, the models that we ran. And with respect to AIC, we used API key information criterion to evaluate those models, which I'm sure you, you heard of. And uh, I apologize, this actually should be QAIC, quasi API key information criterion. Uh, we did assess the fit of our model to the data. And the fit was quite good, but uh, we did actually estimate an over dispersion parameter and we accounted for that in the calculation of, of AIC by adding a, a little uh, variance inflation factor. So this should actually be QAIC because it accounts for a variance inflation factor. And what that means is basically if we hadn't accounted for that, we would have been underestimating our variance in our parameters. So the QAIC basically helps us get better, a little bit better estimates accounting for uh, uh, potential non-independence between uh, each, each data point. So, it's clear that the top model here that we found is the frequency dependent sex specific model. So if we assume a structure of frequency dependence for females and males, this jumped out on top and we compared that against a pure density dependent sex specific model. And uh, this is a nonlinear form, which I won't go into the details of. And then we also looked at mixtures of frequency dependent and density dependent forms between the sexes. So frequency dependence jumps out on top and our estimates of TDI were 40 years. So 40 years prior to the first year of observed data that we used. 
So that would basically say that we, according to this model, if we believe it, CWD first came up in Wisconsin roughly in the early 70s, somewhere around there. So this is the beta male transmission coefficient and female transmission coefficient. Again, they're dimensionless and they don't really make much sense in this context until you put them into uh, a different form. The point though is that the transmission coefficient for males is almost twice as high as females, which fits with what we see in the wild with the prevalence differences in those two sexes. So results. This situation is the no harvest situation, which we could think of in a national park or some other suburban area with no hunting. And on this top figure here, we're looking at disease prevalence over time. And so what we did was we took the best estimates from our frequency dependent, sex dependent transmission model and plugged those into a projection matrix and projected what population dynamics would look like over the next 50 years. And we started from a place where we assume there's no disease. So we, we actually, we've got a clean population and we infect the population with uh, an infected individual. In this case, we infected the population with a two-year-old adult female. During simulations, we found that it really didn't matter what age or sex group you infect it with. So we stuck with a two-year-old adult female. So we infect it and then over time, we let the disease do what it's gonna do. And we also have some parameters, which I haven't shown you, uh, some assumed parameters about survival rate of the different sex and age classes. Uh, and we, th those parameters, though I didn't show you, they're based on what we estimate in, in Wisconsin. Uh, so using those parameters, we put everything into this projection model and roughly we see after 50 years, it settles out and these are the different, these are different age sex groups. So adult males in that, in that situation are gonna have about 60% prevalence. And the male yearlings are gonna be about 50, female adults about 40, and then fawns, which is actually a combination of both males and females, are gonna obviously be the lowest, about 15. So at the same time, if we look in the bottom figure, which is uh, looking at basically deer density as it's relating to this, this time or uh, the, the time sequence. What we find is that the population in this case doesn't go extinct. It can be maintained, but the trick is it's being maintained at extremely high levels of, of disease prevalence in the population. So we thought that was very interesting. It, uh, typically in these frequency dependent transmission uh, model diseases, uh, oftentimes you might find that diseases uh, will cause extinction of species under different harvest scenarios. So we were, we were this, this was quite interesting for us. So when we think about the other harvest strategies, and um, so this, this, this sort of dashed line here is our female focused strategy. The dotted line is our sustainable strategy. And our solid line here is the male focus strategy. And this top figure is our prevalence. So the prevalence level on the y-axis and time on the x, projecting out over approximately 50 years. And again, we, we, we put our best model estimates into this projection model. And what we find, obviously, is that when we use the male focused harvest strategy, it actually results, on average, and a decrease in prevalence over time in the population. Now that's predicated on actually sustaining that 50% that male harvest every year. So you're sustaining that every time you're maintaining it. And that's, 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 that's pretty difficult to do actually. And one reason it's difficult to do is because it's hard for management agencies even to get a handle on what their harvest rates are already. They're, uh, they're, it, it's quite difficult. And there is, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to improve that, that sort of thing. So the point is though, if you could sustain a 50% consistent harvest, you could knock CWD down. It's not gonna get rid of it, but at least you can control it a little bit. So in these two situations, where obviously male harvest is a little bit uh, uh, less intensive, you're not gonna be able to control CWD and it's gonna level out at those, those particular levels. So, uh, 
uh, in all indications is, is, is it, it seems to be fitting these, these trends uh, currently actually, at least on the increase part. And then for deer density down here, uh, these are just the, the levels of deer density you might have under each of these regimes. And I guess not surprisingly, if you're focusing on a male harvest strategy, your deer density is going to be highest, right? Because you're keeping the breeders, most of the breeders in the population, which are going to keep it up. And then a female focused, obviously, is going to result in the lowest sort of resulting population density. So the conclusions, there's overwhelming support for frequency dependent model structure in this case Okay, if we're, you know, and I predicated upon those assumptions that we're not assuming any stochasticity in the system. It's a spatially closed system. So things could change if you're accounting for spatial sort of covariates. So given the estimated parameters, we figure that CWD probably has been in Wisconsin since the 70s. Uh, if we believe the model, if we believe the data, and uh, just to give us a rough ballpark, and there are plenty of improvements that we could make in this model and that are actually in proce pro process right now. Uh, we're working on making the model more realistic by adding extra realistic structures to it so that we can see if, upon improvement, if it changes our, our projections and predictions. And uh, very importantly, too, and this is one thing I didn't note before, the model structure itself you may ask, okay, is, is the model actually assuming direct, direct transmission between ind individuals or is it accounting for indirect transmission? So from an animal to environment transmission. The answer is that we don't distinguish between those two transmission modes. So the model essentially, in essence, subsumes both of them. And those two, those two types of mechanisms are confounded in the way that we've produced the model, okay? So we're not, we're not distinguishing, we can't distinguish between environmental transmission and direct transmission in this modeling exercise. Those two things are sort of subsumed. So another thing that we want to do is actually tease out and actually parameterize a different environmental route versus a horizontal transmission route in the model. Of course, that's going to be adding a lot of complexity and takes a little time and plenty of assumptions about some of the parameter values. Uh, but with that, I'll acknowledge, I'll acknowledge my collaborators. And uh, lots of people put a lot of time into this, and I appreciate it. And thank you for letting me give this talk to you. And uh, happy to take your questions. I'm just curious, what, what if any implications for harvest that has this had uh, given the radically different responses to different harvest strategies predicted by the model? As, as far as has it, has it resulted in a policy change? Yes, exactly. Has it had any impact? Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. Uh, at least not to my knowledge. I've been outside of the Wisconsin DNR world for a couple of years, so I'm not exactly sure what they're thinking. Um, but the, 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 the current sort of strategy, CRB management strategy in Wisconsin right now is nil. They don't, they're not doing anything about CWD. They're just letting it do what it will do. And um, so they're kind of not even considering it at this point in, in, in the context of managing the disease. So it has had zero sort of influence on policymakers, at least in that state. I'm not sure about other states. So, Chris, I, I, more oh. like a comment. Uh -huh. I just think it's really interesting that so it seems like by sustaining the population, you're you're sustaining the disease. But if we were to let the disease take care of the population, it almost take care of itself. But because hunters are so important, we can't do that, right? Let the population it's dwindle, right? Is that kind of what the model is saying? Well, it's it's suggesting that. It's suggesting you've got, you've, got two, you've got two options, basically. If CWD gets into a deer population, then you've got, you've got, you've got two choices. You either let the population, you, you don't manage it, and you might, you might have a deer population, but you're going to have a really high disease prevalence in that population. 
That's one choice. The other choice is that, okay, you, 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 you try and aggressively manage it with this, this male-focused harvest strategy. You can actually potentially get prevalence down, but you're going to have, uh, the deer population is going to be composed of fewer males. And so, obviously, hopefully you can see the conflict there because hunters, in particular, while being interested in hunting for meat, also are interested in hunting for trophies. They like to kill males. And uh, if you're going to have fewer males out there managing for CWD, it's going to cause some, some issues, potentially. So it's, it's interesting that I, I, I've seen, I've looked at a lot of different blogs, hunting blogs, and uh, it, it's really funny to see the, the comments that people make. Um, I was actually quite impressed on a, on a quality deer management website. Uh, <laughs> there were actually some lots of very intelligent comments and, uh, and folks that appeared to support uh, what we were trying to say in, in the model and the conclusions of the study. And my take is that, um, at least my limited sort of view, is that a lot of hunters, they, they care about science and how it relates to deer populations. And um, I, I think they're, they're willing to, to make concessions and, and, and work with management agencies in a reasonable way. So I, in that context, I'm hopeful that we can come up with solutions, reasonable ones. Uh, the policymakers, though, in these state agencies are the key. Oftentimes, those policymakers are not composed of scientists. They're composed of people maybe who don't really have a background in science, but might be appointed for other reasons. And so communicating these messages to those policymakers, despite their background, is a really important thing. Yes? Chris, in, in, uh, in, uh, I'm just curious in preparation for doing any of your kind of more spatially find kinds of things. Have you done some simple uh, kinds of analyses to see if there's spatial clustering in the SAM in the incidence of uh, positives uh, in that, you know, like in your map there, you know, you show us a whole bunch of sample points. Uh, yeah. Has anybody done a simple analysis to see if there's... Yeah, they have actually. They've done some simple sort of cluster analysis looking at, uh, you, you know, correlations between animals over space. And that work has been done by one of Mike Samuel's grad students, um, in addition to other folks, too. And um, trying to remember, the, 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 the correlation, it wasn't a very strong correlation, as I recall. Uh, Julie, do you have any comment on that? You might know better than I. But as I, as I recall, I don't think there was a strong spatial correlation with disease prevalence. So I think it's fairly weak, at least in southwestern Wisconsin. Would you agree so, with that? So uh, does that include uh, like over toward Illinois too? Just, no, just no. Just in, in the red block area? Uh, no, that actually, if we go back to that, oops. Yeah, so it includes this, this sort of yeah, cluster okay. here. Yeah, there's, there's different dynamics we think going on here. These, these are kind of two different habitat types. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is more optimal deer habitat, so it's higher quality sort of for deer. In this area, there's a lot more agricultural fields, agriculture areas, so um, we suspect it's dispersal of deer is probably uh, a lot more of an issue. There's longer dispersal distances in this, this type of habitat. so. A, the jury's still out on sort of the dynamics of what's going on in this, this cluster. So another question I have is, uh, in, in a frequency dependent uh, kind of transmission, is there a point at which, like for what we know about CWD, anywhere in the world, at which you know you can get a low enough prevalence where basically the disease sort of dies, you know, well, I didn't want to say dies out or, you know, I mean, obviously the frequency, Dependent is basically the you're telling us that that line is dependent upon what the prevalence is someplace. Exactly, exactly. And if it's low enough, you know. Yeah. So you know this from like even domestic herds, like uh, you know, and. Well, what the theory tells us, what the theory would tell us in a modeling context is, in a frequency dependent type disease, you might be able to get this this down, all the way down close to zero. 
but it'll never be zero. It'll, you can't. I wasn't you, thinking of that graph. I was thinking of the very first one you showed us, density dependence and frequency dependence. Oh. But that's okay. I mean, you know, you. So the idea is. Rather than it, trying to extinguish it, I'm asking in the so, natural situation. Can you actually control a disease with that, that's it, functioning that's in frequency? Of what Brennan was saying. You know, it's kind of like, okay, is there a point at which it's so low? Mm -hmm. It could be effectively zero. Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. If you could, Do we, know we know that there's it? we know that there's a long lag time between when if the disease first is initiated and when it becomes sort of detectable, right? right. There's a long lag time. A lot of situ a lot of different variables can influence what that lag time would be. So I would guess that it could be you might, under certain situations, get it to that effectively zero point. But how long that's going to last, I don't know. It wouldn't, it wouldn't extinguish the, the disease in a frequency-dependent disease process. Now, you could, if you had auxiliary methods for uh, controlling the disease, like if you could, if you could couple harvest with uh, some sort of um, prophylactic measure, a vaccination program maybe, that would be useful on a wide, broad scale, maybe, maybe you could actually achieve uh, you know, that, that zero point with disease, maybe. So, but you need auxiliary sort of help to get it, if that makes sense. Well, not to me, but that's uh, okay. We can talk about it a little bit. Well, I can imagine okay. <laughs> that it would be almost cyclic. Like, the only way it would drop down to zero is if most of the population died out. And then once the population started rebounding, the disease would spread again and we'd be back to where you were. Right? So, well, I, I'm sort of asking the the sort of evolutionary biology question, where did, you know, where, I mean, it came from someplace. The disease. And, and yeah. Okay, all right, so now you're getting into the origins so now, of disease. Now okay. we're talking about, you know, I mean, because it's not everywhere. Yeah. It hasn't wiped all the uncle right. that's on the, off the planet. And yes. And so on and so forth. So right, really yeah. So uh, you're talking about the origins of disease, which is very interesting, because with CWD in particular, I, I think a lot of people think and have sufficient evidence to suggest that, that it's sort of a, a human-induced disease. You know, it, this isn't a natural type of disease. It, it, it doesn't operate under sort of our natural, you know, uh, world. This is a, a disease that we think has been induced by humans uh, sometime. I mean, we, we only, uh, CWD has only been around since, or known since the 1960s when it was found in Colorado and Wyoming. And we've never had seen anything like this in deer populations in the past. So some people think that CWD has been around forever. And that, oh, you know, you're just, you just have methods now to actually detect it. But uh, that's... Scrapey's known from farther back. Exactly. Scrapey's known from farther back. And one of the main hypotheses that seems to be well supported is that CWD came, originated from Scrapey in some way, shape, or form. So... Um, it's 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 not clear, but there's there's evidence suggesting it. So it depends on what you think is the origin of CWD, and to some extent, I I tend to agree that that man has had a hand in creating, if you will, this 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 disease. So it, it, it's operating under a different set of rules that we than we're used to.